here to the Philosophical Film Festival. It's a great honour. Um, and of course, thank you all for coming. Uh, and I apologise for speaking in English. Bonjour, mon nom Chesky, Ale Chesky, I was hoping that my Czech would let me. Uh, but the Slavic languages don't translate completely across each other. So uh, I'm going to stick to English. Um, and um, so. I'm, I'm going to, my, the, my, my title of my talk is Film Philosophy After Jacques Derrida. Um, I'm not going to assume any knowledge of Derrida, but at the same time, I'm not going to assume that I know what I'm talking about. So I'm, some of you may know a lot more, probably know a lot more about Derrida than I do. Um, and in the talk, what I'm going to try and do is actually do a little bit of close reading of some of the few things that Derrida has said about, about cinema. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll see, it, it, hopefully it's not too dry, um, but I thought it would be interesting to kind of get into the detail of what Derrida had, the little that Derrida says about film, and just to kind of think about what he has to say and what we could take from that for a future of film theory and film philosophy. Um, so the title of my, my talk, um, from philosophy after Jacques Derrida is in fact the subtitle of a book that I've been writing for a long time and have been promising to finish for even longer. Um, and the title of that book is Of Cinematology. Um, and those of you who are familiar with Derrida, of course you'll know that this is a really hubristic reference to Of Gravitology. Um, Derrida's first, well, not his first book, one of the first three books published in 67, alongside Speech and Phenomena and the collection of essays, Writing and Difference. Um, so my promise in the book, perhaps in this talk, is that what Of Grammatology did for language, or for philosophy of language, of cinematology is going to do for the philosophy of film. Clearly, I'm lying, but um, that's the, anyway. That's, that's what I thought might work. So, just to think, grammatology, Derrida, where Derrida invokes the distinction between writing and speech. If you remember, his big project is what is the difference between writing and speech, um, and shows that while we imagine speech to be more attuned to reality, if you like, that if you listen to me speak, you'll somehow get something <clears throat> more meaning than you will if you read the text. There's a, there's a long philosophical tradition of valorizing speech and the writing. And of course, Derrida shows that in fact this is not actually even true in the history of philosophy itself, and that writing itself precedes speech, or you know, what he calls archi writing, archi Um so in cinematology, my claim is that the dyad, the distinction, is between the moving image and language. Um, and language incorporates in this schema the writing-speech distinction within it. And I think, and, and you'll see that later in the talk I'll come back to this and I'll, I'll say something slightly different then, but I think our sense is that while we imagine, or we imagine that the image, particularly the moving image, has a direct connection to meaning. And it's, it's an argument that I've seen when we make arguments for why we should study cinema in philosophy or why we should take cinema theory seriously in philosophy. And part of that is, oh, but film is, you know, it's more powerful, it's more this, it's more that than something else. There's something special about cinema. Now, of course, if you're familiar with Derrida, any claim to being special is immediately an alarm bell. What makes you so special? And, and maybe I'll, I'll try and find out what that is here. But I think it's a problem for, for, for a Derridean approach. So we imagine that the image has a direct connection to meaning. Just as we imagine speech allows access to meaning more directly than writing. And so I think we will see that the image at the end of all of this is in fact predicated on language. Now when I say that, of course, we are then caught in the trap of what do we mean by language? 
language is then everything, and so therefore it becomes kind of a meaningless con concept. And I think that's something that, where, um, you know, the, the, the famous line from of grammatology, there is no outside the text, becomes so true as to be meaningless. But there's nothing outside the text, this is text, we're all text, the text is text. So what are we actually talking about? Um, so I, I suppose I'm trying to kind of think through this distinction, writing, speech, image, where does meaning lie, what can we say about that more, more, more uh, fully here. I think we could take this discussion of the image um, further into the phrase, the image of thought. Now those of you who are familiar with Gilles Deleuze and, 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 and a different tradition of cognitive, um, continental tradition, the image of thought is an interesting idea that comes up in his work and in other, other works as well, is what we have in our minds is thought, but there is something behind that, which is something like the image of thought. Um, so we can push the kind of pictorial metaphor of the image further, um, but I, that, that's kind of also where my philosophy and thinking breaks down, so I'm not sure whether I can do that, but um, anyway. Uh, enough about my title of the unfinished book, but let me move on to the subtitle, which is the title of this talk, Film Philosophy After Derrida. Now, while I was thinking about introducing this, I, I thought, well, I, I, what do I mean by this phrase, film philosophy after Derrida? So first and most obviously, I'm proposing a film philosophy that returns to Jacques Derrida's work and tries to find a way of thinking about cinema by applying, uh, big quotation marks, his philosophy to film. Of course, one of the problems with Derrida is that he, he offers perhaps what we might call an anti-philosophy. You know, deconstruction is not anything. Deconstruction is the movement of life. Deconstruction is what we do anyway. Um, he's, uh, and, you know, if you read his work, of course, he spends a lot of time just unpicking the logic of other people's work instead of saying, well, here is my philosophy. <coughs> so exactly what we might mean by applying Derrida's philosophy, what we might mean by Derrida's philosophy is a problem here as well. Um, but I'll leave that for the time being. So that's the, the, you know, we should come back to Derrida. I suppose part of that, as, as uh, you probably know, so I am the editor of the journal Film Philosophy, and I have been for the last 10 years or more now, 12 years. So it's been clear to me that there are, of course, fashions in theory and in philosophy. And in film philosophy, uh, Gilles Deleuze has been fashionable for at least 20 years or more, since the translation of his books in the late 80s. It took a few years for that to translate into publications, but by the early 2000s, Basically, if you're writing about film and philosophy, you have to write about Deleuze and the two cinema books, Time Image and Movement Image. And some of that work has been fantastic, but it's been 30 years now. And if I have to read one more essay saying whether a film is a time image or a movement image, I'm going to shoot myself. So I kind of thought, okay, this is no longer saying anything new. And once I think of philosophy, however interesting and powerful and so on, is not producing anything interesting, we have to look somewhere else. Now I'm exaggerating a little bit here. And, and my claim is that where we can look for interesting ways of moving forward is Derrida. And his huge range of work. In my own work, I really concentrate on the early 60s, the 60s stuff, grammatology, speech and phenomena, and particularly his relationship to phenomenology. Um, but, of course, his later work, uh, the 70s work on aesthetics, and then the 80s and 90s works on ethics are, of course, really important. And a few people, of course, along the way have, have, have mentioned him in terms of cinema, uh, but there's more work to be done. So, that's after Derrida. Uh, there is, however, a second sense here of after Derrida in English, which is that we are chasing Derrida. We are pursuing him, we are after him. You know, as in the Westerns, you know, say, after him, go catch him. So 
the idea here is that what is that? Okay. So, <laughs> so the first the first way we're coming after Derrida is a traditional veneration of the absolute master. You know, to use the Lacanian, Jacques Derrida, the great god, is going to answer all our questions for us. We are not worthy, as we might say if we were in Wayne's world. Uh, we chase after Derrida's ideas, his philosophy, but somehow we are never quite clever enough to fully grasp them or bring them under our control. This is, I see this a lot in the writing about Derrida. There's quite a lot of, um, that's the way I'm doing as well, there's a lot of, well, clearly I'm not as clever as Derrida, Derrida is the most clever, you can't possibly understand him, but I will try a little bit and so on. So there's this kind of performance of anxiety and of humbleness, but it's also, you know, what the young people call a humble brag, you know, your actual thing is, but I do know something that Derrida doesn't know. Um, to continue the little metaphor of the Western, we're going to bring him in uh, as if he was an outlaw. We're going to put him under control. Um, and we're going to judge the strengths of his film, of his philosophy through the established law of philosophy or of film philosophy. We're going to somehow bring him to task in some way. So, I suppose this, this, this takes us to various debates we've been having about what the term film philosophy actually means. Um, and in the journal, respect the hyphen. Um, the idea is that film philosophy in the bold claim is that film does philosophy in the same way or in an interestingly different but new way that philosophy does philosophy. So this is the bold claim. That when you watch a film, you're not watching an illustration of a thought experiment, just a more three-dimensional short experiment. If any of you have seen The Good Place on Netflix, I mean that obvious yes. kind of, you know, here's the trolley problem. It's a trolley and you know, here's the problem. You know, it's quite fun. It's the first time I've seen anybody read Heidegger in an American sitcom, <laughs> well, at least hold the book, you know, so um, you know, that's all quite interesting. <laughs> but we do, yeah. But we see that um, we, whether or not we would say that that television program is doing philosophy as opposed to illustrating philosophy. Now that's, I think, a, a question of aesthetics, which is broader than, than my talk can deal with. Is you know, can we say that there is a painting philosophy or a poetry philosophy um, <coughs> or you know a knitting philosophy? Uh, in fact, I know friends of mine who worked on dance philosophy. I was at once at a, at, a, at a conference where somebody did uh, attempt to dance their paper. Uh, it wasn't good. Um, but maybe I'm trying to understand dance. Um, or maybe he was talking in, hunt, in, in, in B language, but so it didn't work out. But anyway, so, 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 so this claim here about this, this bold claim of um, Film philosophy is, is something that's quite interesting. It's something that I think that Derrida might help us think through in one way or another. So, film philosophy after Derrida. Um, this paper is both a follower and a betrayer. We come after the master with reverence, but we also secretly, or perhaps not so secretly, hope to find a weakness in the discourse of the master. It's almost a Hegelian thing. Uh, I'm fascinated by the way in which we invoke the great names of the past, ancient and modern, to legitimize and to underwrite and to countersign our own meager efforts at philosophy. And, you know, something uh, identifies proper philosophy as someone who thinks that they're not a philosopher or aren't good enough to be one. So if you're having that fear, you're in good company. Um, but we do make this perhaps from a psychoanalytic move to the comfort of the master. 
this name Derrida, this name Deleuze, this name Heidegger, is the thing that we uh, use to answer our questions. Anyway, here I can speak because Jack Derrida gives me the authority to do so. Okay, enough of my preamble, and let me get on to the next section, which is called Cinema and Its Ghosts. Now, Cinema and Its Ghosts is the title of an interview that Derrida carried out with the Cahier de Cinema uh, journal in Paris in 2001. And it's the most extended piece of discussion that Derrida has about cinema. Um, and part of my talk, quite a large part of my talk, is going to be, the rest of my talk is going to be just thinking about that particular interview. However, in writing about cinema, there is a, a, a short or small tradition of um, discussing Derrida and philosophy, and film, so, and film and philosophy. So the first book, uh, Screenplay, uh, by Peter Brunette and David Wills from 1989 uh, called Screenplay, Derrida and Film Theory. Probably the most extended book um, on Derrida and, 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 and film. Until last year when my colleague Sarah Dillon at the University of Cambridge published a book called Deconstruction, uh, Feminism, Film where she approaches similar kind of problems I'm dealing with, but, but from a feminist point of view, and her book is definitely worth reading. There are a few scattered articles between those 30 years, between 1989 and 2018, but really nothing that we could call a Derridean approach to cinema. I suppose that's, that's all we're trying to do here. Now, apart from this interview in 2001, Derrida did indeed engage uh, with cinema a number of times, especially in a book called Tournée le Mot, um, which, which is almost impossible to translate, especially with my terrible French, uh, which means something like um, start filming the word or turn the word over, something like that. Um, and this is, in fact, deals specifically with Safa Fati's documentary from 1999 featuring Derrida. Derrida's Elsewhere. Um, and he's got scattered um, references to Derrida and to film uh, throughout his writings. And in fact, there's a really funny article in the same issue of Discourse that publishes the English translation of Derrida's interview, Cinema and its Ghost, where the entire article is about the one time he uses the word cinema in of grammatology. It happens in page 10, I think, in the introduction. And uh, Timothy, what's his name, spends 20 pages talking about this one word, which I thought was quite fun, uh, but crazy, but anyway. So let me go on and, and, and talk a little about what he does say about cinema. So Derrida begins, as he often does, biographically, or autobiographically. He begins by discussing his early experience of cinema, as a child in Algiers, and of seeing mainly American films after 1942 um, that were a large part of his, and he says, sensual and erotic education. You learn what a kiss is at the movies before learning it in life. Um, Derrida always likes to put a bit of sex in his philosophy. Derrida says that he is, and this is him, I am not at all a cinephile, but a pathological case that he watches films, but then, and he says, a constant repression erases the memory of these images that nonetheless fascinate me. So he's a forgetting machine, he just watches these films and he forgets them. Derrida finds in cinema a form of emotion that has its source in the projection, in the very mechanism of projection, he says. And it is also, in his words, a challenge to prohibitions of every sort. So for Derrida in the cinema, everything is permitted since the spectator is an invisible voyeur. Um, but, so there's this kind of sexual voyeuristic element which we're very familiar with that kind of discourse. But for Derrida personally, and perhaps this is more important for you as philosophy students or lecturers, is the cinema way is a, is a way of forgetting work. And for Derrida that must, be, must mean forgetting to think. 
and especially a way of forgetting work. That's also why, no doubt, the cinematic emotion cannot, for me, take the form of knowledge or even real memory, because this emotion belongs to a totally different register. It must not be work, knowledge, or even memory. Now, this is the almost classical, classic claim that um, once you start studying film or thinking about film seriously, you ruin it. Um, and especially if you're a philosopher, you're doing proper philosophy in your real job, but once you get to the cinema, you want explosions and sex. You don't want to think about what is going on. And, he's, and Derrida is very funny when he talks about this. He says, cinema, for him, is then an escape from the world of philosophy and of deconstruction. It is a place where forgetting is more important than remembering. Forget what is on the screen, but simultaneously forget the pressures of the philosophical world. For Derrida, cinema is that most cliché of experiences, an escape from reality. It also, as so many have said before, uh, an opportunity to leave the mundane, mundane world of everyday existence behind. You could travel like crazy with the movies, Derrida says. You know, for a young boy in Algeria, in the kind of um, the war, in, in the civil war in, in, with France, or at the anti-colonial war, um, just this idea that there's somewhere else. American films were for him exotic and familiar, while French films bristled with rec recognizable scenery. Now, for somebody who'd never been to France, um, and actually as somebody who grew up in apartheid South Africa myself, again, there's a really annoying habit that Derridian speakers do this kind of autobiography, which we learn from the master, so get used to it. But anyway, growing up in South Africa, we watched films about Europe, and that became, at least in a certain kind of ideological construction, our home, depending on our political status as well. So there's a strange kind of, kind of way where, where the movies provide you with a lost home, even when you're at home. So, the experience of cinema for Derrida was fundamentally colonial, since it instilled in Derrida the sense of a center that was elsewhere. Nevertheless, since student life was difficult, anxious, and tense, the cinema was like a drug, entertainment par excellence, uneducated escape, the right to wildness, la trois à la sauvagerie. Again, terrible French, but the right to wildness, which I quite like. Um, so it's not so much a right to or of inspection. He writes a book about photography called The Right of Inspection, which is quite interesting as well. Um, it's not so much a right to inspection, but rather a license to move to a non-thinking state, perhaps even one that we could call natural. Such a state, though, is never anything but temporary and predicated on the anxiety from which it is an escape. When you're in the cinema, not studying for your Heidegger exam or whatever, you're trying to forget but that background, you know, I'm watching this film and I'm not studying this kind of background anxiety. So for Derrida here, the cinema occupies the position of the Freudian fetish. It is both a pacifier, there is no need to think about your academic work, nor to worry about whether you're clever enough to succeed in the cutthroat world of the university, but it is also simultaneously a monument to your anxiety. You know that you should be working, writing, thinking. The cinema is the space of disavowal, and cinematology is the thinking of that disavowal. So, moving on, Derrida then says, for him, cinema allows for an uncultured relation between the spectator and the image. He says, it is even and the only great popular art. As for me, Derrida, as an avid spectator, I remain. I even plant myself on the side of the popular. Cinema is a major art of entertainment. So Derrida makes very little distinction between highbrow and lowbrow films. And when in the USA, he says he watches countless American films, both ordinary fare and films that are talked about because I am very easy to please. Film's value for him is in the role that it plays in enabling, as I've said, a pure feeling of escape and definitely not any intellectual stimulation that it might provide. 
Now, in the, in the full article, he kind of says, he keeps on saying, oh, I know nothing about cinema, I just watch it for fun. But it, in that kind of annoying way, way, he then shows that he knows the full history of cinema much better than most film students. Um, but he constantly kind of deprecates his knowledge. He says, oh, I don't know anything about it. It's not my specialism. I'm, you know, I'm more interested in Aristotle than I am in, in film. But of course, he knows it particularly well. He says he apologizes that he doesn't have a cultivated theoretical relation to cinema. Um, and he carries on to kind of defend cinema in this way. He says, everything is permitted at the movies, including this coming together of heterogeneous sorts of audiences, the intellectual and, 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 and popular, and relations to the screen, even within the same person. There is, for example, a competition in me between at least two ways of looking at film or even at television. One comes from childhood, pure emotional pleasure. The other, which is more scholarly and strict, deciphers the signs emitted by the images in function of my more philosophical interests or questions. So again, he kind of vacillates the whole time. As well. On the one hand, it's a pure escape. On the other hand, there's something interesting going on here. Here he then uh, introduces the idea of spectrality, the spectre, the ghost. Um, perhaps most famously, his most famous formulation of this is in a film from 1983 called Ghost Dance uh, by Ken McMullen. Um, and he, he has two cameo appearances in that film. Um, this, this, it's, a, it's quite a crazy experimental film about um, a PhD student in Paris trying to work out what her PhD thesis is about. Um, and at one point, her uh, played by Pascal Ogier, who died shortly after the film was finished. But um, at one point, her supervisor takes her to a cafe in Paris to meet Derrida, playing Derrida. Uh, and they have this very short inter interchange with Derrida. says, oh, I'm really busy, uh, so you're here to talk to me about your thesis. So I don't have a lot of time, so let's just cut us to the chase. And he says, tell me the idea behind your idea. And she looks at him and she goes, I have no idea. And he goes, interesting. <laughs> and it ends there. And I was going to think, yeah, if I was being really cruel to a PhD student, says, yeah, cut to the chase. What's your idea behind your idea? But later on in that film, uh, Ogier, the student, comes to his office, and it's this completely uh, improvised scene. Uh, but he says this, this which is kind of a cliche of, of what Derrida says about um, uh, about cinema. He says, uh, "Cinema and psychoanalysis equals the science of ghosts." And this idea that cinema is the science of ghosts is something that he then, then, then comes back to in this interview through the spectral in quite a lot of way. Now, those of you who are more Marxist in your leanings, you know, will probably have read Spectres of Marx, where he, he kind of investigates this in a more kind of Marxist framework, but I'm not going to really go through that. Um, but in, in talking about the cinema, he says, and this is him, he says, the spectre, which is neither living nor dead, dead, is at the center of certain of my writings, and it's in this connection that, for me, a thinking of cinema would perhaps be possible. So, I, on one hand, I think he's saying something very commonsensical. When you watch a film, we know that those, and I'm talking about recorded film, not animated film, so bracket that was for the time, time being, the person we are watching is not the person that we are seeing. This is an image. That person is now doing something else. Their recorded image is this ghost of a past self of theirs. And especially if we see a, um, a film of somebody who's died, for instance. You know, if you watch The Dark Knight. So you can you always watch that and you see the specter of Heath Ledger in the Joker the whole time. And I think uh, that, 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 that comes over quite strongly in that film, especially since the Joker is himself this kind of spectral figure 
that hides behind this mask. So there's a really odd play there. So I, th I think Derrida is saying something very commonsensical here. That cinema is this strange recording of the real, but in a ghostly form. Of course, it, uh, there's something about the supplement. What is, what is, is, is this image supplementary or is it replacing? To what extent is there a, uh, uh, what is the problem about the spectrality of this here? Um, right. So the spectral will leave for one side. Um, he then segues quite interestingly into talking about the specter of the unconscious. Now, Derrida's relationship to psychoanalysis is an interesting one, as I think philosophy's relationship to psychoanalysis is as well. Um, and it's something that I think definitely I find with my own students, there's a real interest in psychoanalysis, which tends to um, erupt as a certain kind of feminism, at least in Phil's thinking. Um, and psychoanalysis gets left behind. But nevertheless, um, there, there's still a lot, lot more to be said about psychoanalysis, I think, uh, in film and in philosophy. Anyway, um, Derrida says, quite interesting on the idea of the unconscious in cinema, he says, every viewer, while watching a film, is in communication with some work of the unconscious that, by definition, can be conferred can be compared with the work of haunting, according to Freud. He called, Freud calls this the experience of what is uncanny, the unheimlich. So if you think back to the idea of the ghost, the ghostly image of the actor, the dead actor on screen, we have somebody alive who is dead. Regardless of whether the actual actor has died or not, if you see your own photograph um, the next day, that person you were is now dead, there is someone new looking at this photograph of yourself in this uncanny sort of way. The home of this is unholy. So the experience of watching a film is an encounter between the spectator, Derrida says, and some work of the unconscious. But it is unclear which unconscious Derrida means here. Is the spectator encountering his or her own unconscious in this viewing? I, I watch the film and it tells me something about my own internal psychology. Or is the film itself the product of an unconscious process? The filmmaker, the filmmaker crew, how we want to think about that, they've created this film which they think is one thing, but because if you're a good Freudian, you never know what you're doing, so your unconscious has made this film. That's, that's more of a Lacanian film, where your unconscious has somehow made this thing, you, not your conscious. So is that the kind of unconsciousness that Derrida means? Or does the film itself possess something like an unconscious with which the spectator communes? Now this is an interesting kind of animist view of film, which really comes out of quite a lot of discussions around film philosophy from Deleuze. Now, for Deleuze in the cinema books, cinema thinks. And the way that, and the reason why he thinks that cinema can think is because it is structured like the human mind. It's the more boring bit of cinema one, the type of the movement image, actually the more exciting one. Uh, people get sidetracked with the time image. But where he talks about the sensory motor schema, you know, that, that very kind of simple Bexonian idea of psychology of uh, perception, affection, action. I walk into a room, I perceive it. I see people in it, that's your perception. Affection, I have a response. Oh, I'm a bit nervous because people are going to listen to me or whatever, or oh, God, it's going to be boring, or you know, whatever your affection is, your, your emotional response to that situation, then followed by action. Leave the room immediately. Or, you know, try and find your... your your talk, or whatever it is, the action of it. So that perception, affection, action circuit, what, De what, what Deleuze following um, Bergson calls a sensory motor schema, and this is the, the, the most simplest kind of philosophical psychology uh, that Deleuze works with. 
Now, he says, if that's how humans work, he then says, films have perception images, affection images, action images. Perception images, the establishing shot of the film. We're in a room. This is the building. We're in San Francisco, wherever it is. The affection image, the close-up of the face. These are the effect, these are the emotions that are happening in the film. Not so much in the character for Deleuze, but in the film. Then there is action. How does the narrative deal with both the perception and the affection? Therefore, in Deleuze's terms, film thinks in the same way that people think. Now, I've never quite understood, because most Deleuzeans will say, oh, it's not a metaphor, it is a metaphor, but not in the metaphor in the way you think it is. So I don't really know what's going on. But the sense is that the cinema functions as a cybernetic consciousness. Now, if that's true, coming back to you know, a long, long-winded way back to my point, is the idea, well, well, would that film consciousness have an unconscious in a psychoanalytic way? Do we want to go that far? Is it human in that sort of way? Now, whether or not we think humans have unconsciousness in the first place is another issue. I mean, if you're an existentialist, uh, then you're going, well, in fact, the unconscious doesn't exist. Uh, the unconscious is a way of you not taking authentic, uh, an authentic choice. Uh, but start with somebody else who can come back to it. OK. Let me just finish this thought, um, and then, then, then I'll kind of, kind of, sort of, sort of begin to, to draw some threads together. So, when we watch the film, we experience something of the unconscious, and which leads us to something of the uncanny. Now, for Freud, of course, the uncanny is predicated on the process of repression. Something has to be repressed in order for it to come back in a different mode to be seen as uncanny. So we can probably assume that Derrida means all of these probabilities of the unconscious. Your unconscious, the filmmaker's unconscious, the film's unconscious. He means something of, of all those things. The cinema is then the space of the encounter between the spectator and the unconscious in as much as the spectator is constituted by the process of repression in the first place. The spectator is then haunted by the repression that is the trace of the unconscious, and it is this encounter with the line of repression that defines the uncanny experience of watching the film. Now, I read that deliberately quite quickly because I'm not sure it makes sense. It sounded as if it made sense, uh, but we might have to come back to it at some point. More broadly and beyond the specificity of cinema as such, the experience of being a subject being an individual must always already be an uncanny one in exactly the same sort of way. What I'm really doing there is kind of spinning what he says to say about cinema into an analysis of how the subject functions in, in the real world. He says a lot more about psychoanalysis. He says psychoanalysis and filmmaking are really contemporaries and so on, but I'll, I'll skip forward a little bit here to what I think is probably the most powerful part of his thinking about cinema, which is believing without belief. So at the beginning he says, Derrida imagines that if he was going to write about cinema, his interest would be in the problem of belief. He says, there is an altogether singular mode of believing in cinema. A century ago, an unprecedented experience of belief was invented. At the movies, you believe without believing. But this believing without believing remains a believing. Uh, I'm sure it sounds really elegant in French as well. Um, now, this believing without believing, those of you working on aesthetics will probably have dealt with the paradox of fiction. How can we feel emotions when we know that something is fiction? Why do I care that somebody's head is blown off? Um, why do I care if somebody's horribly murdered or if somebody falls in love? Or, you know, why do I feel emotions? Um, when you're watching a film, it's a mistake to imagine it's really happening. If you were watching a war film like Dunkirk, 
it would be quite a frightening experience to suddenly, oh my God, we're being shot at, this guy's being killed, oh my, even though we actually know that's true, these people were shot at and, at and killed in the 1940s, but these actors aren't being killed under the safe space of cinema and so on, but I kind of believe without believing in an emotional way. And other work of mine where I've talked more about religious cinema, um, I've tried to reread the idea of belief as not so much as a logical proposition. A plus B equals X, you know, it's a logical proposition. You can believe that, you know, you call that belief. However, my sense is that belief is an emotion rather than a logical proposition. So in that particular work, I've talked about belief as a, I don't think it's a great phrase, but then when I come up with easy certainty, it's also a way of solving skepticism. How do I know we're in this room, that you're listening to me, and so on? Uh, so I, I kind of know it's true. I have an easy certainty. And for me, that's the kind of emotion that I'm trying to identify as belief. Our way of functioning in the world, we generally have this emotional experience of belief that we are indeed functioning in that world. And this problem of skepticism is something that I'll talk about a little bit more um, at the end of tomorrow's film, which we're screening Slack Bay at half past six. Bruno Demont's crazy comedy um, at the Kinetech. Um, and I'm going to talk more about that skepticism um, there as well. Um, so, <laughs> I can see we're kind of into our end, and I've got, you know, there's, there's a lot more that I do in, in this way. I'm going to go through in a lot of detail what, um, what Derrida says about cinema. But I'll end by just sort of summarizing at the end what he gets really interested in, what he talks about more often than anything else, is the video of the Rodney King beating in the 90s, in the late 80s, 1989, I think. If you remember this, that a, um, a black man in America was assaulted by four policemen and beaten to death. And there was video footage of that beating. Um, and in America, at least, that video footage was not admissible in evidence in the court, in the court of law. And those policemen were exonerated and were let free. So, Derrida comes back to this over and over again to the Rodney King beating. He sort of goes, well, what is the place of the image in its relationship to truth and to the law? I'm almost going against what I was saying in the beginning about the image being as something that we understand as having uh, you know, easy meaning. We see an image, we understand it, we see the truth. What he seems to be saying with the Rodney King example is saying, legally, at least at that time, I think the law has changed since then. Legally, even if we see it on an image, that has no force in law. And it's only the word, it's the testimony of the, the policeman that counts. The image does not count. So perhaps something has changed legally, but this is what he kind of fixates on, saying, in fact, the image does not have the force of truth under the law. Now that's kind of where, with that, I, I, I think we need to kind of, kind of think about, well, what is he trying to tell us about um, the status of the moving image as well? This is where I think Derrida, because he's not really talking about fiction film, he kind of leaves us floundering a little bit. However, let me just end with my final paragraph and I'll stop here. He also ends... You know, Derrida likes these kind of words that he comes back to, almost talismans, uh, and the one that he likes for cinema is the archive. And finally, for Derrida, cinema is an archive, and has exactly the same problematic structure that structures all archives. And I've just been to see your philosophical faculty archive there, which is uh, it's got that interesting smell of death and knowledge, <laughs> uh, which I really like. <laughs> so Derrida says about cinema and the archive, he says, the archive is a violent initiative taken by some authority, some power. It takes power for the future, 
it preoccupies the future. It confiscates the past, the present, and the future. Everyone knows there is no such thing as innocent archive. And just so there is no innocent film, no film that is not trying to conscript the past and services of some unknown future. Nevertheless, film is also an avenue of escape, a line of flight, and an opportunity for a deterritorialization that opens up the subject to a future that is not entirely closed. For cinematology, it is fiction film, which after all is all film, that is particularly suited to such escape. Not in there. Thank you, Professor Sofa, for your inspiring lecture. Uh, the political uh, discussion. Uh, and the second one. I would like to start with two questions. Oh, yeah. The first one is connected with the concept of Inkhandi. Yeah. And in about 100 years ago, yeah. so the statement started about Inkhandi. Do you think that we can connect the concept of Inkhandi with the famous uh, category of sublime and sublimity? Because that's, I think uh, that's a good connection with the film. Uh, yeah. We may show that the concept of Inkhandi is somehow the concept of a postmodern sublimity in a way of Jean-François Lyotard described the concept of sublimity. So that's yeah. the first question. And the second one is connected with the famous uh, uh, study of uh, Derrida, sculpture sign and plane in the distance of the uh, humanities, uh, where he is uh, introducing the concept of play, concepts of free play, starting with uh, Schiller and uh, Kant, Kant's idea about the uh, connection between imagination and uh, rationality as a free play. Uh, what do you think, uh, could we, uh, our approach in the film philosophy, the connection, could we put in the way of aesthetics of play? Because uh, there is the opportunity to, to interpret this relation to philosophy from the point of view of the statics of the play. I'll ask you the first question. Yes. The sublime and the uncanny. Um, I, I would... I, I suppose my, 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 my hesitancy about the sublime is I'm never quite sure what people want to do with it. Oh my God, there's this thing that I cannot talk about, look at the beautiful, the romantic. this romantic idea of the sublime. By bringing back the repression, um, and that in a way the sublime might be a trace of the repress, that brings up a, a very interesting problem. Edmund Burke's approach to horror and fear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Because, I mean, Burke's interesting on that bit. I mean, I think Burke wrote that essay when he was very young, yes. so, it's, so it's, it's, it's a little bit schematic. schematic. Yeah. It's a little bit schematic, but there's, in, there's definitely something to be done here. And I think there are the... Yeah. The spine is not always haunting his work. That's a more interesting. The second question on play. So there's, there's two ways one. One is, is in terms of the imagination, what it means to imagine something new, what it means to enter what Derrida sometimes calls the new economy of thought, which is in fact unthinkable. So you know, it's one of the things that I think that he's a profoundly skeptical, non-utopian thinker, even though it sometimes sounds very messianic, the end of structure sign and play, there's this rough beast coming to take us or somewhere else, and it's birth of the new, new monster. Um, he's, he's very messianic, and, and you see his kind of Jewish traditional thought coming, coming through there in his later work as well. Um, so the imagination is in a way of thinking about the future. So we can think about play in that way. However, my my general understanding of Derrida and play, especially in that in that in that essay, is a bit like I think he uses the example of the position is of the pinball machine, where you know, if you want to be a good pinball player, you've got to be able to 
push the machine just enough so that the alarm doesn't go off. The alarm goes off, you've lost the game, but you can't win properly unless you push the machine to its edge. So in that way, you know, his critique of structuralism isn't structuralism is wrong, he says that structuralism is right, but its implications are what we need to take forward. So there's something about how we push the structures, how we shape the structures, which isn't about destroying, which is what quite often I, I think when people use the word destruction or deconstruction, they just mean analyze and destroy something like that. It's not exactly what it's talking about. So, yeah, maybe the hyphen in film philosophy is the hinge where we can play things, where we can say things about philosophy and about film that we can't within their own structure. Something like that. Uh, thank you very much I, uh, for your lecture. I, uh, I really enjoyed myself a lot. I'm not much of a film kind of sort, but uh, I'm uh, quite interested in uh, phenomenology, obviously, mm -hmm. and, then, uh, and then certain uh, adjacent figures like uh, the movie and such. So uh, at the beginning, when you spoke of film as, uh, as, uh, as a means to um, accomplish uh, a certain homecoming, mm -hmm. right? uh, so may or maybe as a, as a way of uh, appeasing some sort of original uh, homesickness. Mm -hmm. um, I, I couldn't help, and that, uh, yeah, at the same time, uh, of, uh, film as opposed to uh, philosophy. Film is playing than philosophy is whatever I'm doing you know, as, as work in my everyday life, etc. Uh, I couldn't help but, uh, but think of, uh, and I couldn't help uh, but think that you were thinking of, uh, of a novalis and more specifically of uh, Heidegger's uh, novalis in this, this very, very, famous, um, um, very famous definition of philosophy as a form of homesickness. Mm. Uh, well, as an mm. original homesickness, really. And so I was, uh, I was looking at this, uh, this, this thing you wrote on the, on the, on the whiteboard, uh, film philosophy, and I was, I was thinking, so if, if, if film is, is a form of homecoming and then philosophy, an original homesickness, uh, isn't what you're getting with film philosophy uh, a form of uh, a proper Derridian double, double bind? Mm. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to steal that. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think the only thing that, and I completely agree with what you set up, that, that thought, my only feeling is, what's so special about film? What about novels? Or television programs? Or, you know, at, at what point are we talking about fiction? And what point are we talking about something that's medium specific? My tendencies tend to, well, I mean, because I'm employed as a film professor, I have to say, oh, film is the best, everything else sucks, you know. But my, 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 my feeling is that this is more to do with fiction than it has to do with film specifically. Presumably, the kinds of things we're talking about were happening before 1895, before the invention of cinema. Now, for Derrida, he says things changed, absolutely. 100 years ago, cinema is unprecedented. Nothing like this has happened before, which I think is, is exciting. But whether I believe him or not, you know, we, because in a way, it seems to me, and again, you're always looking for these breaks as a Derridian. You know, for Derrida, he often says the same, oh, there's this bit where people say, oh, it's suddenly writing was invented after speech. So, to Derridianize it more, we would say, well, cinema precedes the history of humanity. Cinema comes first, and humanity comes later, if we were going to use its own trick of, of doing that. But I think this idea of a uh, philosophy as an expression of a home sickness and film as an answer to that might be a really interesting way. It would be interesting to see how we can develop that. First of all, I was curious, which movie genre do you think is the most philosophical? I argue it's probably comedy. It's, I can wholeheartedly say that I've learned more philosophy from Monty Python than any book ever. 
Mm -hmm. it, yeah, I mean, genres are, are tricky. I can sort of, I think comedy is really interesting, and that's, it's one of the reasons why I chose Slack Bay tomorrow, it is the funniest film I've ever seen. Um, and there is a really interesting um, philosophy of comedy, never mind philosophy through comedy. So that's absolutely right. But I'm just thinking about the kind of genres that film philosophers like to write about. And they tend to be horror films, tend to be comedies a little bit, not so much, I wish there was more. Um, the genre that we call the art house film, that comes out, and I suppose even more than the art house film, the modernist film. I've had to ask for people to stop sending me essays on Ingmar Bergman, Tarkovsky, and so on. All fantastic, but we're kind of full. So those kind of modernist Antonioni, those ones who are explicitly philosophical um, are interesting to an extent. I think it's one of the reasons that Terence Malick is taken very seriously, almost too seriously, especially comparing how terrible his more recent films are. Um, but the fact that he's translated Heidegger, he's a proper philosopher, he knows what he's talking about, so therefore we should take this very seriously. And some of them we should, and some of them like To the Wonder, and Song to Song was pretty bad, but it wasn't as terrible as it was. But yeah, I think what is interesting is to, to kind of think whether popular genres and stupid films have philosophical content themselves. And this is an argument that someone like Stephen Mulhall makes in his first book on film, where he looks at, you know, and in, in late editions, alien, the alien films, which are okay, that's science fiction horror. Then he looks at Mission Impossible, the whole Mission, Mission Impossible series, and then the Jason Bourne series, mm -hmm. and then the Star Trek films. And he kind of, and he tries not to impose a philosophy on them, saying, oh, Star Trek is actually about philosophy of mind. He kind of tries to read them internally as philosophical. Um, so my answer probably would be all film is as philosophical as, it's, as any other. Although, actually, I'm lying. I don't think that's true. I used to think that. Some films are more philosophical than other films. But I don't think it's genre driven. I, I don't think genre is the most important thing. It's definitely a, a guide, but it's not. But comedy and horror are good ones to go with. I do you think that sorry, do you think that making movies are um what is it yeah, yeah, go ahead. I uh, while the, the movie is making there's the actors and everything, the crew, and there's nothing in part of it. Uh, they are signing contracts. They've been told. They've, they are doing what they've been told. Yeah. And then the art came in the end, when the final product is. And we are able to judge them. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the question is, is art art? You know, you've got to buy the paints. It's somebody who makes the paints, they make the paints to that color that you want, they make the brush out of the hair, somebody has to grow the camel to get the camel and the hair and the You know, we could we could reduce that argument to absurdity. So kind of clearly any artwork, particularly let's say from a Chujekian point of view, in the capitalist world, is just part a product that functions just like any other product, although yeah, I suppose uh, I'm always interested in, in the priceless art object, the one that actually underpins the capitalist system. But the one thing that you cannot buy in the capitalism is the Mona Lisa. Because it's too, both too expensive and worthless at the same time. But anyway, that's, uh, uh, but, I, but I think the question is, is much broader than just about film. It's about what, the, what is the role of art in the world. Sure, there's, there's kind of problems of of manufacture and so on, 
But, but I wonder whether your question is more also about group, you know, group activity. That because it's, you know, if you're a painter or a writer, you sit down alone and you do your work. Filmmaking is a collective activity. My sense would be, as a good Derridian, is to say it's an illusion that writing or painting alone is working on your own. There is no magical expression of your consciousness into the artwork, no breathing of life into the artwork. That, because clearly you require a language, you require an understanding of the world which comes from outside yourself and therefore is now no longer pure and is already a collective. So I would say that the collective problem isn't, in fact, there is no individual art in the first place. But there are all the questions about well, what is the place of art in society, and also, and it's what, what Derek sort of comes down to is, is there a difference between popular rubbish and good art film? You know, is there you know, Richard Jones's diary on the one side and Tarkovsky's stalker on the other? Um, are we going to value then this is good art, this is bad art, and how are we going to do that? I mean, I think that's a perennial question for a set that has come up for millennia. Sure, in the 15th century, and say, well, that statue of Christ is that a good one, is it a bad one? You know, make those kinds of judgments. I'm not sure that answers your question. I think is that that that's it. Quite good. <laughs> Thank you. Short question. I'm wondering whether in your cinematology analysis you apply somehow the concept of pharmacon uh, mm. that that applies. To Yes, and this double aspect of remedy and uh, poison. Do you think that the cinematographic writing can also have yeah. those two faces of the Well, I think, it, 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 just thinking about that, it, 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 that does describe very nicely his, his description of, of cinema. It's kind of, yeah, it's a remedy for my anxiety, but it's also actually the cause of my anxiety to stop me. So in that in that way that works really well. More technically, that I'd have to kind of I always have to kind of draw the diagrams of image, language, and where there, I suppose you know because you know in discussions about cinema we always have is it corrupting the youth you know and, and video games particularly uh, stop playing the video games get out there play it's corrupting you it's making you evil. Um, and, and all the rest of that. So I suppose, actually, and, and, and that, that, that perhaps is, you know, my sense that there are lots of, it's called them, uh, concepts, ideas, whatever you want to call them in Derrida, that would be really helpful. Yes, yes, to yes. Think and and the pharmacon yeah. would, would, be, would, be, would be really fun to, to kind of think through that film as the educator is the solver of the problem, but is also the corrupter of the youth. And I mean, it's what we have in film departments all the time. Why come to university to study film? That's just nonsense. You should be doing something real like philosophy, not nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're combining the two together. Thank you, Professor Sorta.